All right. Today's speaker is Dr. Hugh Kraft, um, speaking to us about uh, sort of the history of pediatrics in general. And there probably is no one better to, to talk about this topic as he is to be regarded as probably one of the founders of the Department of Pediatrics here at Carilion and in Roanoke in general. Dr. Kraft trained at UNC for his medical training and completed a fellowship in perinatal medicine at Duke prior to coming to Carilion in 1985, which I believe makes him number one, the longest serving pediatrician in Carilion. I believe Dr. Gay is second and maybe Dr. Keyes is number three at this point in time. Um, so there's hope for the rest of us. Uh, Dr. Dr. Kraft has served in many different capacities in his time here. He served as a section chief of, he's worked as a neonatologist and section chief of neonatology. He worked as an intensivist and a hospitalist and a service chief of the Rona Community Hospital, medical director of the PICU, section chief of community pediatrics, and was one of the partners and remains a, a busy pediatrician at the Carillion Peds Associate Practice at, at Postal Drive. He is also Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine and is very frequently mentioned as either the best or one of the best bedside manners and pediatricians in the Roanoke Valley on a yearly basis. Please welcome Dr. Hugh Kraft. Well, thank you. Um, the, the key to, having, to being uh, recommended as having good bedside manner Take all of your mother's complaints very seriously, no matter how simple they sound. That, that is the key. And if you do that, you'll do very well in the office. Uh, I'm going to talk about some, some pioneers from pediatric past, and I think there'll be some names you've heard, and I think there'll be a few that are new to you, because they were actually new to me as I went through this. Um, and so we're going to discuss some individuals who've made significant comp contributions to pediatrics, explore how social and cultural norms of the time influence lives and the course of history, and, and learn about some really interesting people. Uh, and I, I don't have any disclosures to report. All right. This is our first uh, person from history, and his name was given to a murmur and to a form of arthritis. Anybody know who this is? George Frederick Steele. I, I think he was named after the composer. I'm not sure. Um, Steele was born in, in 1868 in London. He was the second of 12 big families back then. His undergraduate degree was in classics, which is it's kind of like getting a BA now. Um, he had a good liberal arts education. And then he studied medicine at several hospitals in London and, and finished his studies in 1893. And, and he was appointed the first head, the head of the first children's department in England. So he really was the founding father of pediatrics in, in England. And um, house staff photos have changed over the years. <laughs> Uh, this is the house staff, and you know, in, 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 these, in those days, the house staff lived at the hospital, and that's where, where house staff comes from. They, they didn't have an apartment somewhere or a family somewhere. They basically lived at the hospital until their training was finished. And, and we, can see, um, we can see Sir George down here on the bottom. Um, if only the residents could dress that nice today. Um, in, in his early career, he did a lot of different things. He consulted on complex cases. He taught students, uh, residents, other physicians. He wrote and published on a number of different things, scurvy, breastfeeding, congenital syphilis, tuberculosis. All of these were very common back then, pyloric stenosis. Uh, and you know, most of doctoring back then was observing, documenting. There just was not a lot of treatment available. Um, and then he wrote a paper um, uh, that described 22 kids with um, chronic polyarthritis, lymphadenopathy, and splenomegaly, what we call Stills disease today. Uh, onset was before age six. In his series, it was mostly females. And the presentation typically included prolonged 
spiking fevers, and an evanescent rash, which is a rash that kind of comes and goes. And he, he published this series um, in 1897. And, and this is a, a, an image from his paper. And you can see this, this child's clearly got chronic changes in a lot of his joints uh, and, and you know, appears to try to be ill. And this is how we understand juvenile idiopathic arthritis today. Uh, the age of onset is, is young, one to five years. The, the male-female is about equal. It's about 10% of all cases of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and the classic presentation, spiking fevers of at least two weeks duration, fatigue, rash, anemia, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, megaly, colitis, it's fairly common to see inflammation in the chest cavity, uh, sometimes pericarditis. And the systemic findings can precede uh, uh, the arthritis by weeks to months. Kathy Am Amorosa and I had a case of this a number of years ago, and, and she didn't develop arthritis until about three years later. Uh, but she had all the other classic findings of Stills disease. And with labs, you see anemia, elevated white count, elevated platelets, uh, elevated acute phase reactants. That, that's what Stills disease looks like today. And, and the rash is, is it's one of these rashes that if you've ever seen it, you'll never forget it. It's just a classic salmon covered rash, kind of diffuse and up. Uh, and it, it's evanescent, it comes and goes. When the child spikes fevers, the rash will flare. When the temperature goes down, the rash will begin to clear. And then the stills murmur, uh, you can tell he was a liberal arts major. You read his, his, uh, his prose, I should like to draw attention to a particular brewery which has a somewhat musical character, but is neither of sinister omen, nor does it indicate endocarditis of any sort. Its characteristic feature is a twangy sound, very like that much by twanging a piece of tense string. Whatever its origin, I think it is clearly functional, that is to say, not due to any organic disease of the heart, either congenital or acquired. I, th I think if you wrote that in a paper now, the reviewers would reject it and send it back. It just, it wouldn't pass muster nowadays, but it's it's wonderful prose. But it, it, I think even more interesting, he he was a very early describer of ADHD, and actually wrote several papers about children that with what we now know as ADHD. And the, the the writing's a little small, but this says another boy age six with marked moral defect, unable to keep his attention to even a game for more than a very short time, and as might be expected, the failure of attention was very noticeable at school, with the result that in some cases the child was backward in school attainment, although in manner and ordinary conversation he appeared as bright and intelligent as any child could be. The considerations on the nature of the defect may appear speculative to have any practical value, but I venture to think a, that there may, may be some basis in clinical fact, and my reason for bringing him forward in this connection is to emphasize that the other morbid conditions besides defect of moral consciousness may be responsible for defect of moral control. Um, and, and that's a pretty good description of what ADHD looks like now. I'm not sure you'd find it in a modern paper, though. Uh, and, he, and he wrote and presented three lectures on this uh, to the Royal Society uh, later in his career. And, and he, he really had a distinguished career. He, he, was the, he was the preeminent pediatrician during his career. He, uh, he wrote what is the first real textbook of pediatrics that went through four editions. Uh, he chaired the National Infant Mortality Commission for a number of years, and, and he founded the British Pediatric Association. Um, other notables, he was appointed the royal physician in 1926, and two of his patients were right here. That's Princess Margaret and Princess Elizabeth, now Queen Elizabeth II. Um, published a history of pediatrics in 1931, or he retired in 1936, and he was knighted by King George VI in 1937. So, so qu quite a distinguished career 
Uh, unfortunately, his home was bombed during the Blitz in World War II, so he had to move from London to Salisbury, where in retirement he taught English and literature at a local school, and he published a number of poems, and this is one that I really liked uh, from the garden. For my garden is the garden of children, cometh naught there but golden hours, for children are its joy and its sunshine, and they are its heaven-sent flowers. He was a lifelong bachelor, and his, his patients and family, they were, they were his family, uh, incredibly dedicated to, to the practice of pediatrics and, uh, and, and quite, a, quite a legacy. So that's, that's our first one. That's Sir George. And they, these are a few readings if you want to learn a little bit more about him. Uh, I, I really have covered him fairly briefly. He, he did a lot of other quite important things in his career and uh, very, very interesting to read about. All uh, right, patient number, or uh, person number two. Uh, any non-cardiologists know who this is? <coughs> any cardiologists know who this is? Dr. Whitley's nodding. Helen Towsey. Yeah, this is, this is Helen Towsey. And, and her, her Helen, Helen's story is, is just, it, I spent a lot more, I'll spend a lot more time on her because when I started reading about her, I, I started reading about all these other people that were very interesting, so I'd kind of go off on these little tangents kind of follow this person and follow that person. And her, her, her story is just fascinating and compelling. She was born in Boston in the late 1800s. Her father was professor of economics at Harvard, and he's actually the co-founder of the Harvard Business School. Um, as her mother studied biology at Radcliffe. Uh, Helen's mother died when she was 11 years old from tuberculosis. And she was a good student, but she had terrible dyslexia. And she recounted later in life how, how many hours her father had spent with her. He was her tutor. There weren't IEPs or anything like that in those days. So he, he was really her tutor to kind of get her uh, along educationally and allow her to reach her potential. Uh, she went, attended Radcliffe for a couple of years. She was a good student and tennis player. But then she transferred to UCAL Berkeley. Uh, where she finished, and then she took, came back and she became interested in going to medical school, and she took pre-med classes at Boston, uh, at Harvard and at Boston. But it, interestingly, uh, you know, these were different times. At Harvard, she could take the pre-med classes, but they wouldn't give her credit for them. So she went to BU where they, she could take the pre-med classes, but they actually would give her credit for them. But neither school would admit her to their medical school. Different time. Uh, so she went to Hopkins. Uh, anybody know why Hopkins was an early uh, school to admit women? It has to do with one thing and one thing only, money. When the money Johns Hopkins had given to build the university and the hospital and medical school, it began to run out. And so the the administrators were scrambling, and so they, they approached a group of, health, of wealthy heiresses in Baltimore about giving the money to finish the hospital and the medical school. And they, they said, we would be delighted to on the condition that you admit women to the medical school. And so that's, that's why Hopkins was an early admitter of women to the medical school. So she was one of the first female students at Hopkins. Um, she did very well in school, um, did a year of cardiology research after uh, graduating, and then spent two years as a pediatric resident, and then, and then was appointed head of the Children's Heart Clinic in 1930, and she served in that position for the next 33 years. Uh, it, it, interestingly, she began to lose her hearing in the early 30s, so she actually had to rely on, she learned how to use her hands to palpate and kind of know what was going on. And then eventually there were augmented stethoscopes that she could use. But she functioned most, in her, most of her career with very decreased hearing, which is a little bit of a challenge for a cardiologist. In those days. <laughs> this was obviously before echo and, and everything else. Uh, and, um, And then initially, her clinic was focused on rheumatic heart disease, which is actually quite 
widespread because the cause was really not known. Antibiotics weren't around, so there was really no way to prevent rheumatic fever. And so diagnosis relied on history, exam, plain films, fluoroscopy, EKG, and, and, and the child died autopsy correlation. This was not a lot available in terms of therapy. But her, her interest began to shift to children with congenital heart disease, particularly those who had severe cyanosis. And this was a group that really, it, there was nothing to do for them medically, to give them some oxygen, some, some, some comfort measures, but really there were no therapeutic options available, no surgical options. And then during this time, she studied with uh, a physician named Maud Abbott, who was at McGill Hospital in Toronto. And I, 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 I wonder, well, who was Maud Abbott? Uh, any, any cardiologist here, Maud Abbott? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, she, well her, I, I kind of got off on a little tangent on her because she um, I said, well, i got to read a little bit about her. So she, she was born in 1869, and her mother died of tuberculosis when she was just an infant. And she was raised by some other family members. She was an outstanding student. And she was valedictorian of her class at McGill. And um, interestingly, the, the valedictorian gave a valedictorian address. And the dean always kind of edited the address to be sure it was you know, fitting for the occasion. But he said her, hers was so eloquent, he didn't change a single word in it. But she, she was really quite a, quite a remarkable woman. Um, she, McGill, however, would not let her into their medical school. So she went to a small medical school in Toronto, Bishop's Medical College, and she was the only woman in her class graduating in 1894. And then, had, uh, as a lot of physicians did at that time, she went overseas for some training after graduating. That was, that was very common during this time. Um, and so she trained in medicine and pathology at, um, in Vienna. And she had a, a, a significant encounter with William Osler uh, dur during her training and time back in the United States, because he, he had spent quite a bit of time at McGill as, as well. Um, and she returned to uh, Montreal, and she, she, um, she had a very strong interest in congenital heart disease. And actually, she wrote the chapter in Osler's first textbook on congenital heart disease. Um, and she was appointed a the curator of the um, medical museum in um, at McGill. Has anyone ever been there? It's kind of on my bucket list. After reading about her, it's it's a, apparently a world class museum with just you know <coughs> incredible things from the history of our profession. Um, and, and included there was she she had that, McGill had the largest collection of congenital hearts in the world. And that's what attracted Tausig to go and study with her, to, to really learn as much as she could about the anatomy of congenital heart defects. Um, <coughs> Abbott wrote an atlas, which um, for for year, for decades was kind of the bible of um, of atlases on congenital heart disease. Um, and so that, that's <laughs> Abbott and that, her connection with Tausig. Tausig took kind of a little sabbatical year, went to, went to McGill, and spent that year really kind of, you know, um, becoming immersed in all the different uh, types of congenital heart disease. Um, now, meanwhile, about this time, there, was, there were two surgeons in Boston. Uh, anybody recognize Ladd? Ladd's bands? Now rotation. He, he was one of the early pioneers, forefathers, if you want to call him that, of, um, of pediatric surgery. And, and he had quite an outstanding chief resident, Robert Gross. They were working closely together. And Gross was really, he was really interested. In, uh, they, they understood PDAs and what they were, but he, he was really interested in, in, in trying to ligate a ductus. And he'd been operating on dogs and cadavers, and um, but Lad just was, you know, he was a little reluctant. This would have been, you know, at this time, this would have been a, just a groundbreaking case. Uh, so nothing like it had been done, and, and there was no 
you know, that you think about monitoring things that were available potentially for patients to kind of surgery. I mean, it was like a blood pressure cuff and, you know, stethoscope somewhere. And, you know, there were no oximeters or monitors or you know, anything else. But it just uh, uh, raised a lot of worry. So, so what do you all think Gross did? Well, he waited for Lad to go out on the Cape for his <laughs> vacation or something. Um, I don't think Chief Rosas would do this now. Uh, and he took he took his first patient to the OR, operated on her, and closed her duct. And um, and that's Lorraine Sweeney, and she lived till she was about 77 years old after her PDA ligation. And this is a little excerpt from the first op note, uh, which is it's pretty fascinating to read this. Um, incise the pleura, expose the PA, the ductus. You know, it was a decent sized ductus. Put a stethoscope over it, yeah. loud murmur, continuous. And they, they put a suture around the ductus and just tightened it down. And, you know, they, they had no idea what was going to happen. I mean, it was like, <laughs> oh. and, and they just watched for a few minutes. And, and it said during the three minutes that the ductus was occluded, the only sound in the OR was the anesthesiologist ventilating the patient. Nobody else was saying a word. Was that they were just kind of spellbound, wait, you know, what's going to happen? And, and nothing happened, so they went ahead and tied it off. Uh, anyway, it, it said, uh, it said uh, Ladd never forgot about the incident, but he did eventually for Jim Price. They, they went on to write one of the first textbooks of pediatric surgery together. Um, but, you know, this different time. Things like this wouldn't happen now. Um, and then... Towson kind of got word of this because she was trying to figure out, well, what can we do for these kids who have reduced pulmonary blood flow from pulmonary trees or severe pulmonary stenosis? So she went up to Boston in 1940 to talk with Gross about, you know, creating an artificial ductus. It seemed to make a lot of sense. Um, and um, he listened, and he said something like, Dr. Towson, it is so hard to tie a ductus. Why would I want to create one? And and obviously he just hadn't it hadn't clicked with him on you know what what this could potentially mean. Uh, so he she went back to Hopkins and just kind of bided her time. And uh, then we then we we uh, move on to the next player in this saga. And this is this is Alfred Blaylock who was born in Georgia. His dad was a real successful businessman in Georgia, uh, but Alfred wanted to get to be a physician, so he went to Hopkins and graduated in 22. And and he he wanted a he wants he wants surgical residency at Hopkins. He he was just dying to stay, but apparently he partied a little too much in medical school. And and in in those days, they'd literally take one resident. I mean, that was it. If you weren't the one, you. He had to go somewhere else. So he ended up going to Vanderbilt. And, and Vanderbilt was basically a brand new medical school then. That was not the Vanderbilt that we know now. It was like, it was, he described it as, you know, he was kind of sent out into the woods to be a <laughs> um, but, but he really distinguished himself there and stayed on the faculty. And, and he was nominated for a Nobel Prize for his work. He, he in his lab, he 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 dis, he really discovered and defined what causes shock in patients who've been traumatized. And it, you know, and it's third space loss of fluid, and you have to provide fluid back into the vascular space to resuscitate them. And and that you know, we we hear about his procedure, cardiac procedure all the time, but but that work literally say this was this was in early late 30s, early 40s. This, this, this saved thousands of Allied soldiers during World War II. Uh, and not, not a well-known contribution of his, but really probably his most important contribution if you weigh you know, lives saved by it. Um, and so he, 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 was, he, was, he was really at the forefront in research for the causes and management <coughs> of post-traumatic shock. Um, Interestingly, he had to take a year off during residency for treatment of this. Anybody know what these are? He was coughing them up. These are acid-fast bacilli. He had to take a year at the sanatorium 
treatment for tuberculosis. Then, then came back to finish his residency. Um, and then, um, as fate would have it, he he was um, hired to go back to Hopkins as chief of surgery, and really on the basis of his work in shock and the treatment of shock, he was also doing a lot of interesting things uh, related to early vascular surgery. That he he insisted that he bring his lab tech with him, and and it's interesting. He he had been offered two other chairs. And he had insisted he wanted to bring his lab tech, and the institutions turned him down. They said he he could come, he just couldn't bring his lab tech. And and I think in a few minutes it'll be apparent why they they said he couldn't bring his lab tech, and it, it had to do with the times. But but Hopkins said it was okay, so he 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 uh, returned to Hopkins in '41, brought his lab tech. Continued his research on shock, and he's also very interested in treatment of coarctation of the aorta and 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 uh, causes and management of pulmonary hypertension. Um, and you know when when uh, Blaylock came back to Hopkins, Tausig's kind of antennas went back up and said, hmm, maybe this is somebody that can help." Him. So she uh, she approached him in 1941 about creating a PDA to treat kids who had reduced pulmonary blood flow. And he, he said, well, Dr. Talsic, I'll think about it. And so he got together with his lab tech, and together they began to work on the necessary surgical techniques to make this happen. And, and this is an early slide. This, I think, is the second blaylock Talsic procedure. I think they were afraid to photograph the first one because it I'll, I'll get to that one in a minute. I, I think they weren't sure the child was going to survive. Um, but this this is the first case, and this this Dr. Blaylock right here. This is the anesthesiologist. Uh, anybody heard of Denton Cooley? Uh, this is Denton Cooley. He was the intern scrubbing in on the case. And this is Blaylock's lab tech, who he insisted be in the room over his shoulder. Because when Blaylock did the first procedure, his lab tech had actually done this procedure multiple times in dogs. But Blaylock had not done it on anything yet. Um, and his hand was kind of, I'll, I'll get to why his hand was kind of forced to do it without really, he, he had not gone into the lab. He, he had watched his lab tech do it, but he had not actually done the procedure yet. Um, And so this is a paper that described the first three cases that was published in 1945. Um, and and the, the patients are kind of interesting. The, the, the first patient was 15 months old, 4.6 kilos. Uh, you know, 4.6 kilos is an LGA newborn. Um, and she was too ill to obtain labs. And look at the labs on the other two. Room air sat 36 percent, hematocrit 78, post-op sat 82 percent, second patient, room air sat 35, hematocrit 81. And that's just polycythemic response to chronic hypoxemia. So th these are all quite ill patients. Um, and this is a schematic. This is from Blaylock's paper, and this is the first, this is the first patient. They, they ligated the left subclavian. Took it, took down the proximal portion, and then sutured it to the left pulmonary artery, and that's what we call the Blaylock Tausig shunt. Now, it's not. This is not what's done nowadays, but that was what was done for many years. And and this is Blaylock's op note, and you can't. There's a lot. It's interesting to go pull this up online and read the whole thing, but uh, this little part over here is kind of interesting. Where he says the patient was stood. The procedure better than I had anticipated. Interesting from, it's interesting that the cyanosis did not appear to increase very greatly with temporary occlusion of the left pulmonary artery. It's also of interest that the circulation to the nail beds of the left hand appeared fairly good at the completion of the procedure. So good collaterals to the left hand after taking down the subcutaneous artery. I read a little bit more about this recently, and, yeah, and the, the, you know, anesthesia for these cases, anybody know how anesthesia was given for a case like this? It was mask and ether. 
uh, this particular child, when they 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 had they put put her to sleep, and when they collapsed the left lung to to get it get to the to the vessel, she she kind of almost coded, so they had to intubate her. Uh, but they were not they were not intubating patients. Please dial seven seven one 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 for any the, um, blue on the south tower. In preparation for this case. May I have your attention, please? Code blue testing on South Tower. Please dial 77111 for any code blue on South Tower until further notice. Uh, in preparation for the case, he, he approached the chief of anesthesia about doing the case. He went and saw the child and went back and said, Alfred, ain't no way in hell I'm going to do this case. That patient's going to die. And so, uh, the chief of anesthesia got his junior associate to do the case for him. Um, and this is the first patient. And this is this is a post-op image of her, and you see she's got her left thoracotomy score, scar. Uh, and this is her some months later. This did not have a totally happy ending. Her, her, the, I think her subclavian was about three millimeters, and it eventually thrombosed. And the, so they went in to attempt to revise it, and she died of post-op complications. The other, the other two patients actually did well, but they were they were older and had larger vessels to work on. This is this is Eileen Saxon. And then there's been some controversy about, you know, whose idea was this surgery for, for this particular defect? And I think after reviewing what I looked at, it, it seems pretty clear that it was Tulsig's idea of what needed to be done. But then Blaylock and Thomas, who was, um, who was uh, Blaylock's lab tech, they provided the technical and the surgical expertise to make it happen. Now let, let's go. This is a little bit of a backstory. This is Vivian Thomas, who was Blaylock's lab tech, and he was born in Louisiana. He, his family moved to Nashville, and actually, his dad was a very successful builder and contractor. And, and Vivian was going to work for his dad. He was actually quite a good carpenter, but he decided he wanted to go to medical school. And Tennessee State University was in Nashville, and he was saving money. To go to, med to go to college and into medical school. But in 1929, the bank where all his money was went under, and so he lost everything. So that, that dream went out the window. And so while working as a carpenter, a friend of his in, in encouraged him to apply for a lab tech position at Vanderbilt. And this was in Dr. Blaylock's lab, and Blaylock recognized that he, he had an excellent work ethic. He was bright. And he was good with his hands. Um, he worked for Blaylock at, at Vandy from 30 to 41, and then he was able to follow Hopkins, follow him to Hopkins when Blaylock went to Hopkins. And 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 he was not, but he was not allowed. But the, the reason he couldn't go to those other institutions is because he was black. When they when they, other institutions found out that his lab tech was black, they just said, I "Can't come." So and this is just kind. Of, this is what kind of one of the signs of the times and how history. History is influenced by social and cultural things of the times. Um, and Thomas's role in the procedure is really interesting. You know, at, at this time, that there were no vascular surgery instruments. It, there, there was no vascular surgery being done, and there certainly weren't any for you know uh, nine-pound children. So, so, so Thomas handcraft he handcrafted all of these instruments. Himself, and then Blaylock would took them to the surgical supply houses, and they would then make them from Thomas's, the ones that he had crafted himself. He would take a clamp and grind it down, and you know, bend it. And anyway, he, he crafted all the instruments that were used for the early procedures. He was the one that devised the techniques for suturing small blood vessels. You know, that just hadn't been done. There weren't any tiny needles for sut for suturing small blood vessels. Thomas made all those by hand, and, and he had performed multiple this, this procedure multiple times on animals. 
and this was the first animal, this was Anna, uh, who, who uh, underwent and survived the first Blalock Towsky procedure. And in Thomas's later career, he worked at Hopkins from, from 41 to 79. He, 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 his lab was the lab that trained all the students and residents and, uh, in, in surgical techniques. He, he was kind of, he, he was the one who the, the surgeons cut their teeth on learning their techniques with him. But he was slow to receive recognition for his contribution. However, in 1976, he did receive an honorary doctorate from Hopkins, really finally recognizing you know, all that he had done for, for uh, uh, the surgical program and for the patients that benefited from it. And then there, there are two portraits in the lobby of the lab building at Hopkins now. And one of those is Alfred Blaylock, and the other one is Vivian Thomas. And Thomas's portrait was commissioned by all the residents that he trained during their time at Hopkins. So there was some, some justice eventually for all that he contributed. And uh, Thomas wrote an autobiography, um, Partners of the Heart, and HBO thought enough of it to make a full-length movie. So Alan Rickman, when he had a break from Harry Potter, um, was, was, was Alfred Blaylock, and most of was, uh, was Vivian Thomas. And I actually, I have the DVD on this. If y'all want to do a movie night one night. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually, it's an incredibly compelling story. Uh, it really is. Uh, and, and, won some, and won some Emmys. Uh, Tausig's later career, she directed the, heart, the pediatric heart program until her retirement in 63. She trained most of the first generation of pediatric cardiologists. 120 fellows from all over the world. She wrote the first text, kind of the Bible of pediatric cardiology. Uh, she developed some other interests. She became, she developed interest in what are the causes of cardiac and other birth defects. And one of her fellows was from Germany and called her to tell her about this epidemic of children, the babies they were seeing with limb reduction abnormalities, and she traveled over there, and she was instrumental in, in convincing the FDA not to approve thalidomide for use in the United States. <coughs> so we really did not see the thalidomide epidemic in the United States, but there were over 10,000 cases in the world before it was finally pulled from use. So, and and that's, a, that's kind of an interesting side story, that whole story. Um, later years, she was the first woman to serve as president of the American Heart Association. She continued to follow and report on the children that had had surgery for general heart disease, and, and she received um, many awards, honors, Presidential Medal of Freedom, and others. So she, she had really qu quite an amazing career. And those are a few readings. Uh, about her, if you're interested, and actually, this is a very interesting reading on her relationship with Maud Abbott and what she learned from her. And so that is Dr. Helen Tausi. All right, does any non-oncologist know who this is? All right, oncologist Sydney Farber. Um, essentially, Sydney Farber is not a pediatrician, but he kind of became one. Um, Barbara was born in Buffalo, third of 14. Graduated from what is now SUNY in Buffalo. He wanted to go to Harvard, but um, at that time, Harvard had pretty restrictive entry requirements based on race, gender, and ethnicity. And he was from a Jewish family, and it was hard to get into Harvard if you were from a Jewish family. So he went abroad. But he did well enough his, his first year abroad that he got back into Harvard as a second year. And then graduated in, in, in 27 and then put, went, did a residency in pathology and became the first full-time pathologist at Boston Children's Hospital. And then he, Farber had incredible interests. He... he um, his interest ranged all over. He, um, he authored what was then kind of the definitive textbook on the post-mortem exam. 
he wrote a very early paper on unexpected death in the first year of life. It actually it was an early describer of SIDS. About a, about a quarter of his of the patients that were in that report had, had clearly died of SIDS. So he, he had an early early observations there, and he, and he published studied and published papers on celiac, pancreatic insufficiency, CF, vitamin deficiencies, encephalitis. He he was just just uh, intellectually very curious. And, and like other pathologists, he had, he had autopsied hundreds of children that had died of leukemia and other malignancies. And they, they were, he and some others were starting to think about, well, what, you know, what could we potentially do to treat these patients because they, they have a uniformly fatal disease? Um, and and, and as, it, as it turned out, the, the biochemist that was working on folate was actually at Harvard at this time. And he was synthesizing some folate analogs. Some of these were inhibitory in their effects on cell growth. So um, Farber kind of took an interest in this and, and um, said, well, you know, maybe we could try these out in some patients that have leukemia. And so th this is, these are lymphoblasts of, of ALL. And, you know, leukemia is not nearly as defined as well as it is nowadays because there weren't markers and genetic and things like that, but the, the, he, they, they, um, they decided to test aminopterin, which is related to methotrexate, <coughs> on 16 children with uh, acute leukemia. And this is the paper. And I think it, it's hard to it's hard to overstate the impact this paper had. When the New England Journal looked back at most cited papers over over a hundred year period. This paper was the most cited paper, and there was no other paper even close uh, because it, it was an absolute blockbuster when it hit, hit the press because, you know, kid, kids, die, kids with leukemia all died. There was, there was no treatment, a little bit of supportive treatment, but there was no treatment to potentially prolong life or cure them. And so this paper reported 16 children with acute leukemia treated with aminopter, and 10 responded, and the paper details <coughs> The, the five best responders. They, they're all, all young. And all of these kids demonstrate a reduction in leukemic cells in the bone marrow, peripheral white, cal, white counts normalized, and in some cases the blast cleared from the peripheral blood. Um, hemoglobin and platelet counts returned to normal, and all had some reduction or resolution <coughs> in splenomegaly and lymphadenopathy. And, and this was just, I mean, when, when this hit, to, hit the news, this was just, it's just hard. It, it, if a paper ever made the ground shake, this was one of them, because because uh, previously there, there was there was no therapy. So this was the beginning of chemotherapy for cancer. Uh, and this slide just shows you know that folic acid. It's just differences at two positions between folic acid, methotrexate, and aminopterin. And as it turned out, I think methotrexate proved to have a little less toxicity, and that's why it has become. <coughs> the first antifolate to use to treat cancer. And in Farber's career from there, he went from being a pathologist to being an oncologist. Um, he, he, he founded the Children's Cancer Research Foundation in 47. Right, this was right after that paper, or right after that study was completed. And um, that, that, that's a really fascinating story to read about the Jimmy Fund. That, that's a uh, that's a, a little story unto itself, but this was the precursor of what is now the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Um, he became the national spokesman and fundraiser for cancer, and, and literally for 20 years he was the face of cancer research. He was testifying before Congress, and um, this was during a time when funding for cancer research really was accelerating. He, he played played a large part in that. Uh, his lab also demonstrated the efficacy of myosin D against Wilms tumor. It was the first lab to produce platelet concentrates, and and he wrote an early paper in the 60s that that described the team approach for caring for children with cancer: the oncologist, the nurse, uh, the social worker, the pharmacist, everything. And that that was really the first paper that kind of looked at having a team approach to caring for illness. Uh, and, and he spent just t tireless amounts of time 
working to increase funding for cancer research and treatment. Uh, and he died at his desk in 1973 doing exactly what he wanted to do. And this is a quote which I think really sums up his approach to life. The purpose of life is to spend it on something that outlives you. No man finds his ultimate end in himself, but only, in, only by sharing it with others. And, and uh, you know, Farber was a true, he, he was a pathologist, but we'll include him in the family of pediatricians based on, on all that he did for cancer treatment. So those are a few references on Sidney Farber, if you want to read a little more about him. All right. Final, uh, oh, and I want to put a plug in for this. Uh, has anybody read the book? Okay. Anybody seen the PBS series? Okay. I, I think Dr. Dunsmore should make both of those requirements to finish your residency. <laughs> they, are, they are both outstanding. Um, uh, it's just, uh, the, the book won a Pulitzer Prize, and the, Ken Burns produced the PBS series. And it's, uh, if you get a chance to, do, to, to see one or the other, or, or, or both, uh, take advantage of it. Um, okay, last person. You get my score before your SOL or SAT. Virginia Abgar. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> Virginia Abgar. All right. Um, Virginia Abgar was a little bit of a prodigy. She uh, went to Mount Holyoke. She played on seven sports teams, worked on a college <coughs> newspaper, acted in theater, played the violin. And I think she, and she was a valedictorian of her class. So um, incredibly talented woman. Um, she was one of four women in her class at Columbia. Um, she entered anesthesia training after two years of surgery. And she trained at the University of Wisconsin, which was the first anesthesia program in the United States. And then in 38, she was named Chief of Anesthesia at Columbia, and, and she was the first woman to head a division at Columbia, uh, and very highly regarded teacher and clinician. Um, she developed uh, the anesthesia services and the residency program at Columbia, uh, but was passed over for the chair uh, when that came up, and anesthesia became a department in 1949. And after this, she developed most of her time to the effects of obstetrical anesthesia on the mother and the baby. And she, but she was the first woman appointed a full professor at Columbia. Um, and she devised what we now use, the simple method for assessing a baby's condition right after birth, the APGAR score. This is her first paper. And you know, it's always interesting to go back and read some of these early papers because it's, um, it, it's just, you're, you're reading history. Um, so this is the first paper that described the APGAR score. And the score uh, includes the five things we're familiar with, heart rate, respiratory rate, muscle tone, reflex irritability in response to suctioning, and color. Um, and you know, it's interesting. I think this is true. I, I read differing accounts of this. but. Um, one account was that she, she was in the hospital cafeteria and a medical student was asking her, you know, what things would you look at if you wanted to assess a baby's condition at birth? And so she wrote these five things out on her <coughs> app. And um, then she realized, hey, I could do something with this. So she took the napkin and ran back to her office and kind of from there, you know, it, uh, took off with it. So, you know, curious medical students, y'all do sometimes ask very good questions. So. <laughs> uh, a few years later, someone came up with a little mnemonic for, for her name and the APGAR score. So A is activity muscle tone, P is pulse, G is grimace, response to reflex irritability, appearance is skin color, R is respiration. So, another way to remember it. And she, like Farber, she had a second career. She would, went to Hopkins in 58 to work on her master's in public health. She wanted to get a little more, a little more grounded in statistics. And then in 59, she went to work with the March of Dimes, directing their division of congenital malformations. You know, uh, prior to the late 50s, the March of Dimes was focused mostly on what illness? Anybody know? Polio. 
And then with the polio vaccine, it, the March of Dimes had to find some other, some other important health issue to focus on, so they, they went on to, to prevention of birth defects. So that's, that's the position she, she took. She uh, traveled and she spoke all over the world, and in her spare time, she made violins. Um, she was on the faculty at Cornell uh, uh, in a position specializing in teratology for about 10 years. And then from 68 to 74, she was director of research uh, and VP for medical affairs at the March of Dimes. And she published a, a, a very nice book uh, for parents. And I took this out from, from her eulogy. Now, every time I read this, I get a little misty eyed. With her, life was exciting, her youthful enthusiasm and energy boundless. She was warm, compassionate, had a great sense of humor. Integrity was her hallmark. Her approach was forthright, direct, realistic, and practical. She was loyal, generous, always dependable, and despite her many talents, she had great humility. Uh, I'm not sure I've, heard, I've read a, a eulogy much better than that one. Uh, and it, tr truly, a truly incredible woman. Um, okay, let's see. And those are a few, a few readings about Virginia. You want to read a little bit more? All right. Janie said I had to have four, had four questions. <laughs> I don't think these are too taxing, but we'll see. All right, which of the following is not a finding in juvenile idiopathic arthritis? Diffuse salmon colored rash, spiking fever for at least two weeks, strawberry tongue, pericarditis. Okay, all right. Number two, the bolic talcic procedure improves systemic oxygenation. Is a high resistance to low resistance shunt, increases pulmonary blood flow, all of the above. Okay, two for two. All right, which of the following did Sidney Farber contribute to cancer, treatment of cancer? Use of the team approach for cancer care, first successful administration of chemotherapy, use of platelet concentrates to treat thrombocytopenia, all of the above. All right, y'all are on it, on a roll. All right. Uh, this is the toughest one. <laughs> Which instrument did Virginia Abgar make when she was not assigning Abgar score? <laughs> Dang. All right, and Virginia Powell's talk last week reminded me that it is never a bad idea to end with a picture of a dog. <laughs> and so... Dr. Kraft, thank you for an amazing Grand Rounds. This was really excellent, and I hope it encourages everybody to think about what your roles are as you go through and how curiosity should define your daily work and what it can mean to others all the way along the way. Um, and I would have to say that you're one of our pioneers here. Thank you so much. If I've had room for one more, I was going to put my card in. <laughs> Well deserved. Any other questions or comments in the room? All right. There was a question online, but I think you answered it. Let me grab it real fast. Make sure we get get them all in. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think this was in Stills generation. Gen, let's see. In Stills generation, was there surgery for pyloric sty, uh, stenosis? No, not yet. That's what I, I thought you answered that. Yeah. All right, any other questions in the room? I'm going to unmute the phones here real fast. Drag my microphone up here. All right, if you're on the line and you do not want to ask a question or make a comment, please put your phone on mute now. The conference is now in talk mode. Hey, does anyone on the line have a question or want to make a comment? Alex, this is Virginia Powell. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi. That great talk. I really enjoyed it. I'd love to see the picture of the dog, but I've been <laughs> um, I did a rotation at Hopkins in, when I was in residency, Maryland. Um, I crossed town for that one. But um, while I was there, there was a grand rounds in which they played a video clip of um, an interview with Helen Talzik where she discussed um, designing the the shunt and, and the work involved in that it was just fascinating to listen to. 
Thank you very much. Okay. Any, other, any other questions or comments on the line? Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you very much, sir. As always, you can uh, email us your questions at outreach at corellianclinic.org and we can get them to Dr. Kraft. With that, we're going to go ahead and disconnect the phone lines now. Thank you all very much for joining us.